Hi, Mr. Zapone here, and today we're going to look at breaking a vector into components. We've used the tail of the tip method and parallelogram method and so on to turn components into a resultant vector. And now we're going to do the opposite. We're going to take a resultant vector and break it into its uh, horizontal and vertical components because this is going to be very, very, very useful when we are solving uh, projectile motion problems. So if we have a golf ball, and let's say you hit a golf ball eastward at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the ground, and the golf ball has an initial velocity of 30 meters per second, what are the horizontal and vertical components of the golf ball's motion? So we're going to represent that velocity of the golf ball as a vector. That vector has both magnitude, 30 meters per second, and a direction. Uh, 30 degrees, an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the ground in an eastward direction. So we have a vector quantity here with magnitude and direction. And I want to know the horizontal and vertical components. And this, this ball is going to basically travel sort of a curved path and hit the ground. So what I want to know is the speed of the ball just in the x direction, right? And I want to know the, I should say velocity, the velocity of the ball in just the y direction. So I essentially want to take this resultant vector and I want to get two component vectors from it. And in order to do that, we're going to have to do a little bit of trigonometry. And we're going to use the sine function to get the y component. Uh, because if we think of this as a triangle, sine of 30 equals the opposite side, this is the y, so sine 30 equals the opposite side over the hypotenuse. And of course you can bring that up and sine of 30 equals velocity in the y, this is going to be my velocity in the y, and down here we'll have velocity in the x. So if I want to know just the velocity in the y, sine of 30 equals that. Right about. So really, I just bring the 30 up, 30 times the sine of 30, and that's going to give me my velocity in just the y direction. And we're going to do the same thing for the x, but since the x uh, component of motion is down here, we can't use sine. we got to use cosine, because cosine is the adjacent side uh, divided by the hypotenuse. And again, we take cosine of 30, this angle in here, and that equals the adjacent side, which is velocity in just the x direction, and divided by the hypotenuse. So again, that 30 comes up, and 30 times the cosine of 30, and that's going to equal 26 meters per second. So this is kind of like a river problem. Uh, if you could swim across a river at 15 meters per second, but the current is pulling you down, 26 meters per second, completely fictional numbers. The net result is you would apparently do something like this. So if you were on the shore of a river and you started swimming directly across at 15 meters per second, but the current was pulling you, you would go off like this. Um, so the idea is we took a resultant vector, or we took a vector, and we broke it into a X component and a Y component, a horizontal and a vertical component. And what that means is we can describe the motion of the golf ball using these two component vectors. The golf ball is always going to be traveling in the x direction only, ignoring every other direction, at a rate of 26 meters per second. And in terms of the up-down direction, uh, the ball has an initial velocity in the y of 15 meters per second. But what makes the ball land? Well, naturally, gravity. If you, as you throw a ball up, it goes up. It slows down and it returns to where it came from because gravity is slowing it down. In the y direction, there's going to be an acceleration of negative 10 meters per second squared. In the x direction, if we ignore air resistance and that the ball has any sort of backspin on it, which obviously we can't ignore in the real world, but for learning how to break a vector into components, that's useful. Uh, we will ignore that. The ball is always going to, there won't be any accelerations in the x direction. The ball is just going to have a constant velocity. It's going to land with the same speed that it was hit with. So if you hit the ball and it starts initially in the x direction at 26 meters per second, when it lands, 
it is still going to be going 26 meters per second. But the y direction, the ball is going to go up in the air, it's going to slow down, it's going to fall and have the same velocity but in the opposite direction. So again, using components, um, again, it's sine and cosine using trig functions. To get the y component, we use sine. Use sine to get the y, use cosine to get the x. I would recommend not memorizing this. Just know Sokotoa and right triangle uh, trigonometry. Anytime you look at a triangle, if you want to know the y component, just realize that sine is opposite over hypotenuse. You could memorize it. That's another way, too, or you could use it so much you'll memorize it. But there will be times we'll get a little weird where these are going to flip when we're on inclines. But uh, for the most part, just know trigonometry. Uh, you should be doing enough of it now to where sine and cosine are fairly routine. And why do we break a vector into components? Um, so we could answer questions about the motion of projectiles. So let's take this typical or this uh, specific golf ball that we hit at 30 degrees, 30 meters per second. Now that we know the horizontal and vertical components, the vertical and the horizontal, we can answer these questions. How long will the golf ball be in the air? How high will it get? How far away from the spot will it, from the spot it was hit, will it land? And what you can really do is you can ignore, um, to answer this first question, how long will the ball be in the air? Well, this uh, X component of motion has nothing to do with the vertical free fall up and down motion. So you can kind of ignore all of this. You can treat this like an isolated problem. Let's say you just threw a ball upward straight up in the air at 15 meters per second. How long will it be in the air? You can simply ignore all this. That's the power of breaking a vector into components. So now this just becomes a free fall problem. Um, I know that the initial velocity in the Y V initial equals 15 meters per second. And when you throw a ball up in the air, and I have my watch here, if you throw this up in the air at 15 meters per second, it's going to fly up in the air. Gravity is going to slow it down at its maximum height. It will come to a complete stop. And then it's going to start accelerating downward. And it should hit your hand at the exact same speed you throw it with. So if it's going up at 15 meters per second. It's going to slow to zero. It's going to come back down. It's going to hit your hand at 15 meters per second in the opposite direction because one velocity is a vector. So we should know that the final velocity equals negative 15 meters per second. And we're looking for time. So we know we need a T. And it is a free fall problem. So we know that A equals negative 10 meters per second squared. And if you think back to your kinematic uh, equations, is there an equation that you can use to solve this? I think there is. V final equals V initial plus AT that has all the variables we need. So again, when you break a component vector or when you break a resultant into the components, it allows us to answer questions like these because we can ignore all these. We're only concerned with the Y direction right now. How long will the ball be in the air? And we know just the Y component here. We can ignore all of this. This motion can be broken down into these two component vectors. So if we really think about it, we can simply do what I did here and use this formula. V final equals V initial plus AT. Uh, v final is negative 15 because it's going down. And that equals 15 minus 10 because gravity is negative times T. And if we algebraically solve this, you subtract 15 from this side. And that becomes negative 30 equals negative 10 t and of course we bring the negative 10 over negative 30 over negative 10 is three seconds so the ball will be in the air for three seconds and again if you ever get a negative time value just realize you mixed up your sign somewhere so again this just becomes a free fall kinematic problems like the other ones we did because when we are dealing with just the vertical time of flight we could ignore all this stuff we don't care about the angle of launch or the x component of motion because we're only concerned with the vertical and the only acceleration in this problem is going to be gravity which is going to act exclusively in the vertical direction and the same thing how high will the ball get and again we can ignore all of this stuff none of this matters the x motion does not matter when we are dealing with this problem and I know it's hard to realize this sometimes but we can just treat this problem as a ball is thrown up at 15 meters per second. How high will it go? We don't have to worry about any of this stuff, any of these angles. Once we get this component, we can simplify our problem into a free fall.
kinematic problem in one dimension. So how high will it get? Well, we know that when you throw a projectile upward, it starts with some initial velocity at its maximum height. How high will it get? It's going to slow to zero velocity, and then gravity is going to pull it back down. So we know that the V initial equals 15 meters per second, and we know that the V final at the maximum height, at its maximum displacement with respect to the ground, uh, is going to equal zero meters per second because gravity is going to slow it to zero. Uh, we know acceleration. Acceleration equals negative 10 meters per second. And they're asking us to calculate how high will the ball get displacement. So in this case, because we're in the y direction, we're asked to calculate delta y or y. And if we think about our kinematics equation, uh, v initial, v final, and acceleration, and, uh, and a y, well, this formula right here fits. Again, we don't have to memorize our kinematics equations. We just got to know when to apply them. We know a V final, it's zero, that cancels. So zero equals V initial squared, which is 15 squared. Uh, I'm going to cut out units because it makes it a little simpler here. And plus 2A delta Y. A is negative 10, so 2 times uh, negative 10 is minus 20 and Y. And we just got to solve this for Y. So square the 15. Um, bring it over, right, and that's going to be negative 225, that should be 15 squared, negative 225, um, divided by negative 20 equals y, and you get 11.3 meters. So again, um, we got to resolve or break this vector into its components, and then we can treat the motion individually, just like we do with river problems. We can treat the uh, current and the vert or the uh, y motion as you're going across the river separately. It makes our life a lot easier. And to answer the final question, we're going to use the same reasoning, the same rationale. How far away from the spot it was hit will it land? Well, the total time of flight, as we calculated, was three seconds. We did that in step one. It's going to take three seconds for the ball to go up and come down. As the ball is going up and coming down, it is traveling to the right. Always. Now we want to know how far. We want to know horizontal displacement. We don't care anything about the Y. We don't need to know any of this. We're just working in the X direction. So we know that it has a velocity of 26 meters per second. We know that T equals 3 seconds. Well, velocity equals displacement over time. So we use this simple formula. Uh, 26 meters per second equals x over t, or 26 times t, 78 meters. So the ball will land 78 meters from where it was hit. And again, I can't stress how important this is, breaking a vector into components, taking this vector here, and getting an x or a y and an x component allows us to solve projectile motion problems. Without doing that, we could not answer these questions. So we have to do that to figure out how long an object will be in the air, how long or how far away it will go, and so on. And just to finish up, I want to do one of these problems just to make sure we can break a vector into components. So we might as well do the first one. For each image below, determine the x and y components using trig. Well, realize that we have an angle here. I want to know this right here. I know a hypotenuse. I know an angle. Sine of this angle equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I'm going to use sine to get the y component. Sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of 40. And this is meters. It's a displacement. So I'm just going to put in, uh, we'll put in a y because it's the y displacement over 25 meters. So really, to get this y component, uh, that's like saying you walk uh, your result 25 meters at 40 degrees north of east. Um, but anyway, you just 25 times the sine of 40, and that gives you your y component. So again, this is a sine function. And to get the x component, well, you use cosine. Cosine of 40 equals the adjacent angle, the x component, equals your x component of motion over your hypotenuse, 25. And that allows you to figure out this and this. So basically, 
Normally, you'd be given these two components, and you put them together. You add them using tail to tip, and you get a resultant. But we're going from a resultant into components using trigonometry. So we're kind of doing the opposite of the tail to tip method. And again, hopefully you realize uh, why this is so important. Because when we are doing projectile motion problems, if we had something like this, the velocity of a ball, a ball is like hit upwards with a baseball bat at 67 degrees at this speed. Um, how high will it be in the air? How far will it go? There's lots of problems like that we need to solve. So in order to do that, we need to figure out just its velocity in the x and just its velocity in the y so we can ignore the parts we don't need and solve the problem very easily. And hopefully you know how to get components from a vector. This is Mr. Sapone.